welcome everyone to this Food, Food for Thought webinar um, about the life and legacy of the Reverend Thomas Bayes. I'm Stephen Haberman, uh, Professor of Actuarial Science at the Business School. Um, just as way of background, you, you will all know that we're changing the name of our business school to the Bayes Business School in September. So what we're going to talk about today is who was the Reverend Thomas Bayes? What do we know about him, his work, his life? We know where he was buried, very close to our main building in Bunhill Row. And what's the story of his famous theorem, which has had such a profound influence on probability theory and modern statistics? Um, it's our immense privilege and pleasure to be welcoming Professor David Bellhouse, Emeritus Professor at the University of Western Ontario in Canada, who's published extensively on the history of probability and statistics and has written a biography of Thomas Bayes. So he's here to talk about Bayes um, and we've got the usual format. That our guest David will speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So straight over to you, David. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, let me start with uh, why is Thomas Bayes important, or his theorem at least. Um, briefly described, Bayes' theorem is how do you update uh, current beliefs or current knowledge uh, with uh, new knowledge? Um, so that would be take your prior knowledge, go out and obtain data, and update uh, uh, the prior knowledge. So basically, uh, that was that's the basic idea. Um, how Bayes approached it was um, very simply: um, you have a bunch of successes and failures uh, that you have uh, uh, observed. Uh, what does that say about the probability of success? And um, the prior, the only prior knowledge you have is you know nothing about the probability of success. So his theorem uh, was published in 1763. Um, um, Richard Price brought the theorem to the Royal Society and uh, two years after Bayes' death. So with that brief introduction and the fact that uh, Bayesian methodology is with us today all over the place, um, used in many, many different areas. So it's a very important field right now um, what do we know about Bayes? Well, he was um, born in 1701. Uh, we don't know the exact day of his birth. Um, his parent, his father was a, a Presbyterian minister. He was a nonconformist uh, in his, in his uh, religious beliefs. Um, the family had been uh, discriminated against earlier uh, because of their religious beliefs and things were only opening up in about 1689 with the act of toleration. So Bayes grew up uh, in that uh, atmosphere um, and um, uh, he was uh, destined for the ministry. Uh, he went to uh, what's called a dissenting academy. These were academies uh, set up in England to train uh, young students for the ministry. Uh, he went to one in London um, after he finished in London at about the age of 18, 1719, he went to Edinburgh. Again, there was a, this set of uh, discriminatory practices where he couldn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. So he went to Edinburgh, took theology at Edinburgh, and also um, studied mathematics at Edinburgh. He probably studied mathematics when he was at the Descending Academy. Um, they were quite famous for their interest in mathematics. Uh, again, it was interest in mathematics because of uh, Sir Isaac Newton's work in what was called natural philosophy, but now it's physics. Um, so they were interested in that because um, you wanted to understand creation. And the way to understand creation was uh, through Newton's methods, uh, Newton's theories, and then through mathematics. So after he finished at um, Edinburgh uh, without uh, taking a degree, he came back to London. 
Uh, he worked for with his father for a while. He was then ordained as a minister, as a Presbyterian minister. And uh, in around 1733, approximately, uh, he moved to Tunbridge Wells uh, to uh, uh, take up a church uh, in Tunbridge Wells. Um, for those of you who are tourists, uh, you want to go to Tunbridge Wells. Um, the church is still standing. I've seen it uh, from the outside. It's no longer a church, but it's some kind of business. Um, and uh, so when he was in Tunbridge Wells, uh, he, well, uh, uh, yeah, he wrote uh, a uh, treatise, a uh, theological treatise, and he wrote a short treatise on uh, calculus, or what was called fluxions, uh, because of George Barclay's um, uh, criticism of Newton's calculus. Uh, he, he wrote an answer to that, and so he became known a bit in the mathematical community uh, for this work. And um, in the late 1730s, he met up with uh, Philip Stanhope, uh, second Earl Stanhope. Stanhope uh, lived near Tunbridge Wells and visited Tunbridge Wells, and probably that's how he met Bayes. Um, the two of them began, began corresponding on mathematical subjects. Um, in the, the Center for Kennish Studies are a sets of manuscripts by Bayes uh, on various mathematical subjects, mainly dealing with um, uh, calculus. Um, but they also started corresponding on, on um, probability theory. And um, they apparently were motivated by reading through uh, Abraham de Moivre's second edition of his Doctrine of Chances. So they were working through those problems in, in the Doctrine of Chances. Uh, the interesting thing is that Bayes is known for his famous theorem. When he was working and corresponding with, um, with um, Stanhope, one of his solutions, or the only solution that he sent to Stanhope on the theory of runs, which is given a set of a series of successes and failures, you want a certain number of successes in a row, so a run of successes, uh, his solution is incorrect. So of the two known probability solutions by Bayes, one of them is incorrect and the other one is incredibly influential. So um, from um, Stanhope, from his work with Stanhope, in 1742 Stanhope uh, nominated Bayes for fellowship in the Royal Society. Um, he was made a fellow in 1742 and he had um, four other people who nominated him, but I believe it was Stanhope uh, who, was the, who was the main driving force. Um, the theorem um, was probably discovered in the late 1740s, although it was published in 1763. Bayes never, um, of, of the mathematical work that he did, he did not publish anything. Um, the work that he did publish, the Bayes', Bayes theorem and one other thing related to um, de Moivre's approximation of the binomial, um, he, he didn't publish that. It was never published in his own name. And so, um, his theorem was never published in his own name. And um, so the thinking is that it was discovered, he reworked on it at the end of the 1740s because there is a, a, um, a quote uh, by a philosopher, David Hartley, who refers to the theorem, um, does not refer to Bayes, but just calls him his, my ingenious friend. Um, and so that's a, a vague indication that it was known before um, it was well before it was published. So when he died in uh, 1761, um, the story goes that um, the family contacted Richard Price to ask Price to go through uh, Bayes's papers to see if there was anything of, of interest. Um, that was a, in a memoir uh, of of Price by uh, his, his nephew. And so I think he was being very um, 
supportive of, of his uncle. And I think it was the other way around that Price was had heard of Bayes's work uh, on this inverse probability problem. He probably contacted the family to, um, to be able to look at the manuscripts and he found the manuscript that was of interest to him. Um, the reason Bay, um, Price was probably interested in the manuscript was that it dealt with a new way of looking at inductive inference. And his, when you look at the, the paper itself, the first part of it is just pure theory. Um, no motivation, no application, just pure theory. And when you look at Bayes's manuscripts uh, that are surviving, they're all pure mathematical theory, no motivation, no applications. Then when you get to the second part of the manuscript that shows up uh, in, in published form, the second part is due to price. And that uh, has reflections on things like um, Bayes theorem uh, can be used um, to infer the existence of God. Um, he has an application of the sun rising tomorrow based on all of your experience of the sun rising every day and during your lifetime. And so all of the applications are, are um, uh, done by Price. So you can uh, thank Price uh, for the, the applications. He's now the first Bayesian um, uh, in the world. And uh, Bayes, again, came up with a mathematical theory. Um, there was speculation about um, Bayes wasn't sure that what he was doing was right. Um, I think that speculation is incorrect. Bayes, uh, his solution involved a, uh, an incomplete uh, beta function or an incomplete gamma function. He needed an infinite series approximation to get it. And I think he just wasn't satisfied with his approximation uh, because after uh, Price presented Bayes' paper, a couple of years later, he presented another paper on a better approximation. Um, Bayes died in 1761 in Tunbridge Wells. His uh, body uh, was brought back to London. Uh, he was buried in, in Bunhill Fields. Um, Price is also buried there. So if you want to see Bayes and the first Bayesian, uh, walk outside your building and, in, and into the park. My uh, my experience in visiting Bayes' tomb about 25, 30 years ago was uh, I was a young man then. Um, I was too far away to get a nice picture. I hopped the fence, uh, went close to the, the, the grave, took my picture. Uh, there were a couple of drank, drunks uh, sleeping it off in the background. They thought I was taking pictures with them and they started to chase me. So I hopped the fence again and outran them. So that's my, my first Bayesian experience. Um, uh, my 15 minutes are approximately up, so I'll give you lots of time to ask questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, for, thanks very much, David. <laughs> and thanks for the entertaining story. I've, I've got, got a nice image in my mind of you running across a graveyard pursued by drunks. Um, so just on Richard Price, do you, do you think he recognized the importance of Bayes' theorem, perhaps more so than Bayes himself? Um, that's really hard to say, again, because Bayes doesn't write anything down. And he keeps his, his, his manuscripts were all just circulated to friends. Um, so Stanhope had a cache of a, at least a dozen of Bayes' manuscripts on mathematical problems, some of which could have been easily published, and one of which was published by another friend, John Canton, a couple of years after Bayes' death. Um, so it's, it's very hard to say um, if he recognized the importance of what he had done. Um, he might have, but um, he, he uh, again, neglected or never bothered to publish. Um, why 
He never bothered to publish anything is difficult to say. It may not have been the thing to do for a clergyman. It's hard to say. I just, I've got some questions, so I'm going to. Uh, no, I've, I've got a question on branding, which I think Caroline is going to deal with. Um, okay. So he, he did some, he wrote quite a bit of stuff about probabilities. You were talking about the, yeah. the case of runs. Um, so was there, is there any uh, evidence there of his interest in the conditional probability, which I guess is what provokes um, the Bayes None theorem. whatsoever. It, that was basically, that problem was basically going through Demois' book and um, solving or resolving, coming up with different solutions to Demois' book. Um, the possibility, and I've been exploring this with a colleague, um, the possibility is that De Moivre commented in a 1738 book when he came up with a normal approximation to the binomial. There is a comment that, that you can interpret as he thought it solved the problem of inverse probability. And so Bayes had definitely read that since he had tried to fix up what he thought was fixing up uh, uh, De Moivre's proof of the a normal approximation of the binomial. So he was he was definitely aware of what De Moivre was saying about inverse probability. And that may have motivated uh, him to, to look into uh, inverse probability. There is no firm evidence. And uh, I know that when I when I float that suggestion to various people, they're not keen because there's no evidence, but it's highly circumstantial, but it's evidence that I kind of like. And I mean, you were talking about um, him becoming a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, I guess Royal Society was a different sort of body in those days. It was more of a- It was a, a gentleman's club. A gentleman's club, yes. A gentleman's club interested in science. But you did have to show that you were, that you had an interest in science, that you were, had an ability in science, unless of course you're an aristocrat. If you're an aristocrat, you got in automatically. But what Bayes did, uh, my conjecture is what Bayes did was that he, he solved a problem that De Moivre had worked on. It was another mathematical problem. He'd come up with a different solution uh, it was called the problem of trinomial divisors, nothing to do with probability. Um, but he solved this problem. And I think that was his uh, entry essay into the Royal Society that he showed that he was good at mathematics uh, and that got him into the Royal Society. So I, I have a question um, from one of our professors, Roy Batchelor, about the picture of Bayes that we find on oh, yes. Wikipedia. So I, you, you've told me that you don't think it is Bayes. No, I'm almost certain it's not Bayes. If, if you want to find the picture, just uh, Google Thomas Bayes, click on images, and you'll probably get several versions of it. It was published in a book um, in the early 20th century, I think, I forget. Um, Steven Stigler apparently was so excited about the picture that I think he bought the copyright to the book. Um, but um, I analyzed the picture uh, years ago as part of a contest uh, put out by the, uh, uh, the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. And there was a picture of Bayes and the, and the question was, who was, who is this man and when was he born? And I won the contest by saying that it's not a picture of Bayes. And the only thing we know is the birth year was probably 1701 because of the change in the calendar um, where New Year's Day started on March 25th. Um, in any case, why is it not Bayes? If you look at similar portraits um, from the same era, uh, you find that the the gowns that the nonconformist 
uh, ministers wore or the the overcoats or whatever they called that they wore were quite tight to the chest. That uh, gown of baize is very flowing and it's very 19th century. So the picture is anachronistic. Plus the, uh, he's not wearing a wig. Uh, there's a picture of his father uh, or painting of his father. He's wearing a wig. Um, the, a complete contemporary was a guy named Philip Doddridge. He was wearing a wig, a shoulder length wig. And there's a contemporary, approximately contemporary picture of Price. And he is also wearing a wig, a, a fashionable but out of date wig for his time, which was a, a wig that came down to about here with earmuffs, something that looked like earmuffs. So in that picture of Bayes, he's not wearing a wig. He's, his gown is anachronistic and his clerical collar is also anachronistic. That, it, that, it, and that again is, has a 19th century look to it. 18th century collars would look uh, slightly different. So if you want to promote your business school with a good picture of Bayes, you, in my opinion, you don't have one. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, there, there are some questions coming through now. One is from um, what, one one of your former students, who's a professor at CAS, uh, Valley Azimit. Oh yes. And he and he wants to know what what do you think is the future of Bayesian statistics? I mean, it it does seem to be now much more mainstream than it was, say, thirty years ago. Yes, uh, thirty years ago it was. Um the whipping boy of many statisticians, probably because, because of Sir Ronald Fisher, who is now, who's now out of favor uh, for various reasons. Um, so it was the whipping boy for a while, but then it's, the, it's actually, it makes sense. It, in terms of inference, it makes sense. Um, taking um, a, a current belief collecting data about it and then updating the belief. And the reason why it it's, can, is now becoming popular is that it was criticized for um, uh, the prior probability, the, the assumption of the prior probability is not being realistic, not um, um, being mathematically feasible, but now with computing, um, you can come up with a nice model for your prior probability um, and calculate your posterior through uh, what would, if we did it by hand, enormous computing effort, but would only take a couple of minutes using a good computer. So um, it's really the way to think about things. It's, it's the proper way to think about what you're interested in making an inference about and now you have the computing tools in order to do it. And I think um, it will take over. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another question that's come through from Hamish Armstrong is, I mean, what are your thoughts about our business school taking the name of Bayes? Um, I have a, a two opposite thoughts. One is um, it's a good move in that um, Bayesian statistics and Bayesian, Bayesian methodology um, is, uh, uh, is at the forefront and probably used by an incredible number of people in the business school. So it, it kind of describes um, one of the main tools that you use. If you want to get negative about it, um, somehow you have a business school named after a minister of the church, which doesn't seem for many people to go together. And, but he was a dissenting voice as well. He was a he? dissenting minister, yes. And he was yes. a very uh, logical thinking dissenting minister. So in the things that he wrote, he was, he, he, when he made an argument, it was always a very dispassionate logical argument. So in the, in the conflict with um, Barclay over the calculus, uh, for example, um, 
Barclay, um, uh, his, his book uh, re refers to the infidel mathematician, possibly Edmund Halley, uh, but uh, um, Bayes said right at the beginning of his book, um, this is not, uh, just stick to the scientific questions, don't get into uh, verbal abuse essentially. And so he was a dispassionate, when he argued, he argu argued logically and dispassionately. Uh, another question has come through this time from Anish Banerjee, um, and it's about, about data and the importance of quality of data. Now, I guess Bayes never thought about this, but clearly it's an important part of any application. Um, Bayes did think about it once. Um, Thomas Simpson uh, had written this uh, a paper about um, error distributions, and um, so Bayes was asked to comment, um, I forget the exact details, but he's said that the, um, the measurements you're taking is only as, well, one way to put it is the measurements you're taking is only as good as the measuring instrument. So if there's a bias in the measuring instrument, then uh, what you're, the inferences you're making are not very good because um, uh, Simpson's paper had been about how do you combine measurements? What's the best way to do it? And the mathematics that he, he went through showed that the sample mean uh, was the best estimator. And Bayes was commenting that, well, it might not be if your measurements are biased. That is interesting. Uh, so that he had thought about that as well as um, just in, in a way, the mechanics of the mathematics of his Theorem. Yes. Yes. I'm going to go just go back to the Q and A list to see if we have any other questions. Perhaps the final question, and slightly light-hearted, from Andre Spicer is: What's the strangest story you've come across about Thomas Bayes? The strangest story? Um, well, it was strange for me. Well, let me just give it as a not not. There's nothing strange that I found about Bayes. He is such a nice, obscure man that very little has been found out about him. But my favorite story about discovering things about Bayes was um, I, I, when I wrote my biography of Bayes, I needed some money to go to, to uh, the, um, do work in some archives in England. So, um, I wrote a grant application to my university for sort of in-house funding. And uh, I was denied the, the funding because uh, my, my proposal was too speculative. So I went anyway, and I went to the Center for Kentish Studies because I knew that there was a, a folder there of um, Stanhope's papers that said, uh, uh, papers to and from uh, eminent mathematicians. And I was hoping to find letters with uh, Martin Folks discussing why they should put Bayes up for fellowship in the Royal Society. When I received the folder and opened it up, there was a dozen manuscripts by Bayes that no one had ever seen uh, since, uh, uh, since uh, uh, Stanhope's death. Um, so I, was, I sat there in the library stunned for about five minutes. I then uh, looked through all the other folders and I, I uh, found um, uh, his mathematical folders and decided to come back a year or two later to look at Stanhope's mathematics and everything else he'd done. And I had rejected uh, this one folder that said, um, annotations on works of Chaucer. I couldn't figure out why the heck uh, Stanhope was writing on Chaucer. Anyway, I just left it aside. Two years later, I came back, went through all of the mathematical manuscripts. Didn't find, well, I found the material that I wanted, but then I came across again, annotation on works of Chaucer. I said, what the heck? I'm going to look at that, see what Stanhope has to say about Chaucer. And it was annotations of works on chances, spelled with a C-H-A-U-N-C-E-S, rather than Chaucer and the librarian had got it wrong. 
And there I found um, Bayes' work on uh, theory of rhymes. So um, I was, uh, my favorite stories are about my luck in finding <laughs> Walt Bayes. Well, that's a, a very good place to end, given that he, he was a probabilist. Um, so thank you very much, David, for speaking thank with you. us today for your fascinating insights into the life and work of Thomas Bayes. Um, next week, the Food for Thought webinar speaker is Simon Brocklebank Fowler, president of Firehouse Communications. Um, thank you, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Goodbye. Thank you.